everybody. This is Tracy with Cat Breeder Sensei, and I'm super excited to have Miss Erica Kessler on with me today. She's agreed to um, come on and talk about something that we all love to talk about, taxes. <laughs> so thank you, Erica, for agreeing to take the time today. I appreciate it very much. Um, thank you. And taxes, um, I joke about that because I know it gives me anxiety every year when it's time to do my taxes. And all I have to do is like get my, you know, get my numbers together. And I have a tax accountant that I've been using for, gosh, like 20 years. And she handles everything, but I still get anxiety about it. Like, oh my God, it's tax time, you know? Sure. So it's great to have um, someone with knowledge that is willing to help the pedigree cat breeder community specifically because that's just not something that is readily available. You know, this is kind of specific. And I know when I started, I had questions, specific questions about like what I could um, deduct if this was a business or a hobby. And so we're going to cover all of these things um, today. So um, if you will, can you just tell us a little bit about like your background and how long you've been involved in this business? And I know you're a breeder yourself, so that's even better. That's very cool. So just a little. Yeah. I am a Maine Coon breeder. Um, I have been breeding about five years, but I am also a CPA licensed in Missouri. And I have been licensed for about 14 years. And I have my own practice that I started before I was licensed. Um, in Missouri, you can do taxes without being licensed. It's a little bit scary, um, but you can. And so I have a variety of clients. I even have some dog breeders um, that are clients as well. I don't have any actual pedigree cat breeders. And um, but, but the tax perspective and the tax side of breeding um, can be scary, but um, it really shouldn't be. It really shouldn't be. Yeah. I, I mean, anything that we can be educated on helps take the edge off, you know, if we can just learn about it. So just some basics will help everybody. Um, let's start with like record keeping, because that is one of the things that People are either obsessed about or they don't care mm -hmm. to do it at all. Um, how important is record keeping for us breeders when it comes to tax purposes? It's very important. Um, the IRS does have actually a record keeping requirement for um, for your tax return. So whether if you are key or pedigree cat breeding as a business or a hobby, you really should have records to support your tax return, however you're putting it on your tax return. And the IRS doesn't have a specific format requirement, but you do need to keep the records to prove your income and your expenses. Right. I got a question about this. Um, is your bank statement, because that pretty much like it logs, you know, where you're spending your money, what day, almost down to the time and minute. Is that enough of a record keeping for the IRS if it, you know, you can produce bank statements that show that you spent the money? It does show that you spent the money. Uh -huh. It also does show had the income come in on the deposit side of things, but it may not show the eligibility of a deduction. So it may show you spent money somewhere at some place. Uh -huh. um, it does prove that, but you, in some instances, not all, depending on what the purchase was for, you may want to also have like an invoice or a receipt to prove what that expense was for. Yeah. So for example, if you shop at a, a supply store, they don't, they might need the actual receipt to see what was purchased there to know that it was an eligible deduction. Right. Okay. And then um, what about like paper receipts versus digital? Do you recommend any specific app? like that you know maybe are good for record keeping or I don't know if you know there 
There are several different apps that you can use um, to do your record keeping, to keep it, track of expenses. Um, of course, the biggest market share for accounting expenses is QuickBooks Online, um, but there are others out there. There are Zoho Books, there is um, Wave, there are FreshBooks, all those, and all of those have apps where you could capture a digital copy of your receipt, and a digital copy is acceptable to the IRS, just like a paper copy. You just have the same keep storage requirement, you know, keeping um record retention right of those receipts whether it's digital or paper right i got a question that uh, about this too record keeping how long do we have to keep our records for so it depends minimum of three years i will say but it also depends on um, a few things basically you want to keep it as long as the statute of limitations of your tax return is open mm -hmm. and in general that's three years Okay. There might be instances where it's a little bit longer. Um, for example, not that any breeders do this, but if you have unreported income and it's more than 25% of your gross income, the statute increases to six years. And so you might keep that. Um, the IRS normally finds that unreported income maybe in an audit when they're reviewing bank statements. Okay. All right. Um, let's, let's talk about deductions now or expenses that yeah. we may overlook. Now, I mean, I guess I would assume people know, but we can't always assume that they can deduct like some of the expenses that are required to run your cattery, um, mm -hmm. are things like litter, food, veterinary expenses, you know, these are kind of kind of the things that we absolutely have to spend our money on in order to keep the cattery running are those expenses and what are some other ones that we might not? Sure. So some other ones you might not think about, um, of course, those are easy ones, all of your supplies, your litter, your litter boxes, the, the veterinary. Um, some other ones you might not think about if you run your cattery out of your home, you might have an office in your home. And so you there is a home office deduction um, that you would be able to take. And there are requirements for that. They're stringent requirements. It has to be a space that's used only for your business, 100%. And um, they have a couple options and ways you can take that. Um, there are also maybe depreciation deductions. So say you have a separate outbuilding where you stud maybe, you know, for your stud or even your cats, that building could be depreciated and you would have um, a deduction for that as well. Um, something a lot of people may not realize, um, especially for breeders that are like sole proprietors, um, they can hire their kids. You can legally hire your children under 18 and pay them a payroll, but you also don't have payroll tax. So you kind of get to have your cake and eat it too. There are specific requirements for that, that they have to meet, but that is something that they could do. Um, another option is um, for the sole proprietor or Schedule C filers is they can hire their spouse. And now you do still have to pay payroll tax on your spouse, but you it's a possible way to get some of your medical expenses as a deduction that you normally could not because your spouse is now an employee. And so if you have a section 125 plan, for example, you now can deduct those that you would not have been able to before. Nice. How old does the um, child have to be before you can hire them? Um, there's no set age for a minimum. There's no, the IRS does not have say, you know, the child has to be 10 years old or whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. The child has to be old enough to be able to do the work that you've assigned to them. So it yeah. has to be age appropriate. Right. We just talked about, we was talking about this with someone else and they were saying, they were talking about using their young child mm -hmm. in photographs, mm -hmm. the cats, and we're talking young 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 child and putting them on payroll for a tax deduction and they're a model they're a model so right yeah <laughs> that's a that's yeah. i've had clients have their um kids that they put the stickers on folders or you yeah. know depending on the age they might even scoop litter boxes depending on the sure. age so it, it does need to be work and you do have to give them a W-2. And so there's some um, requirements to be followed, but they're not super difficult. 
Yeah, that's awesome. That's probably probably one of the best tips that people don't yeah. talk about is hiring hiring your child. Um, are there any? Of course, we know this comes up. You know, um, hobby versus business. Mm -hmm. It's okay. huge. Yeah, that's it's one of the biggest. Like this, is, I'm just a hobby breeder, but there are rules that the IRS have outlined on what makes you a hobby and what makes you a business. Can you talk about that? Yes. <laughs> so there are two ways, I guess, in which your income from the breeding could be taxed as a hobby or as a business. There are tax differences in the two. And if you are taxed as a hobby, you report all of your income for all of your kitten sales, cat sales, whatever, but you don't take any deductions for that. Um, the, but the difference between that and a business is the hobby income is not subject to self-employment tax, just regular income tax. On the business side, there are specific requirements that you have to meet and that the IRS has a little test that they will do. If you meet those requirements, then you can deduct all of your expenses, your litter, your, you know, all of your supplies, your payroll for your kids, things like that. Um, and you could show a loss potentially um, if you are a business. A hobby can never show a loss. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so do you are there are the simple rules that, that identifies you as a business? Yeah, there. so the IRS has what they have called nine factors. There's nine questions that they will ask if, if they are um, questioning you on your tax return on whether it is a hobby or a business. Oh, yeah, I and, and I actually did a, a blog post about this, and I put those questions yeah. um, on there, so... You guys can go to catbreedersensei.com and I actually have a blog post that says, is cat breeding a hobby or a business? And the IRS mm -hmm. are on there and it's, I pulled them right from their website. So you can actually yeah. go to the website. Yeah, it's right out there. It's publicly available and you can look at those and it's a case by case basis. Um, they don't say, okay, if you answered questions, you know, one through six, yes, then you're a business. They they look at everyone individually and look at the overall um, um, character of the business of, of each taxpayer. So, you know, you might have two different breeders and one they might say is hobby and one they might not. It really depends um, on their specific situation. But those those questions are very, very valuable. They do also have on the IRS website, um, a audit guide for hobbies for um, businesses that are not engaged in for profit. And you can go through and read that guide. Um, you know, it kind of gives you their rule book that they have to use and you can see what they're looking at when they're looking at your business or your, your hobby. Um, I know this is kind of generalized, but would you say that most breeders are hobby or business? I tend to think that most breeders could technically fall under business. I mean, honestly, based on the nine factors that they have there, mm -hmm. um, of course, every breeder is different. But I mean, for one, a lot of breeders spend a lot of time on their cats. Mm -hmm. And a lot of breeders are doing um, a lot of the research. They're trying to get the expertise. You know, that's one of the factors is, do they have expertise in this? And are they trying to improve their program? Are you trying to improve your business, your profitability? Um, I think the time and effort that is spent is the biggest, biggest one. Um, but I, I tend to think I sure wouldn't do this for fun. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so for no pay. It's it's great. I love the cats, but I think it is nice to be compensated for all of the work and effort that go into it. Yes, and you know I'm 100% in agreement with that. Um is there anything that applies like tax regulations or considerations that's specific to cat breeders? So the biggest one would probably be um, like the co IRS code section 183. That's the hobby kind of rules, hobby loss rules. 
Um, then there's the general business deductions, and that's co IRS Code Section 162, you know, your ordinary necessary expenses for business. Um, breeders, the, one other item that many breeders may not think about is, and some breeders might say, hey, you know, I've when they want to kind of swap kittens, kind of change lines and get fresh stuff in, bartering rules might apply in that case. So you technically should count in your income, you know, the value of um, the cat that was sent to the other breeder and then vice versa. The other breeder would count in their income, the value of the cat that they received into their program. Um, some other specific tax regulations whether hobby or business, they might need to think about as sales tax requirements, and that will vary by state. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's totally different than IRS. Yeah, very yeah. different. Um, I know this question has come up in our group, um, the No Judgment Zone Cat Breeder Community is our Facebook group. If you have not heard of it, you guys can find us on Facebook. Um, if a kitten passes away, it's already born, it's in the litter with the others, and it's intended for sale, but it it unfortunately passes away. Can you deduct that as an expense? I will say generally no, because yeah. you had you did not purchase that kitten. The kitten was born to your cattery. You did deduct or you can deduct the cost of care for that kitten, the veterinary care, any food, any formula, medications, things like that will still get to be deducted. But if you think of it in this way, if you had sold that kitten, let's say you sell that kitten for three or $4,000, whatever, you would have income of three or $4,000 extra. Mm -hmm. That kitten did not sell, so you do not have that income now on your tax return. So in a sense, you're getting a deduction by not having income for that cat, but there's no separate deduction for the loss of a kitten. Right. It's not a, it's not a uh, reducing the amount of your taxable income when, when one dies, right? Okay. Thank you for that. Um, are there any credits or tax incentives? This was a kind of a, you know, wild shot to ask, but Anything that's available to uh, cat breeders that they don't know of? There's not a specific credit for um, tax breeders, or sorry, uh, specific tax credits for breeders, but there are many credits that, um, you know, a breeder might get such as bonus depreciation. You know, if they, it, like I said, for example, the outbuilding, or if they bought some other equipment, then um, that would apply. And then of course the hiring of the children if they're sole proprietor and um, those types of things would be credits or incentives that are available um, to the cat breeders. Right. Um, when you purchase a new cat, because that's one of our biggest expenses is acquiring mm -hmm. a new cat for your cattery. Um, how is that factors in on a tax return? Is that um, an expense all taken in one year or depreciated asset? That's a great question. It really should be depreciated asset. In theory, anything that you're going to use more than one year, you're going to depreciate. And now there are there are options on depreciation where you may take the full, recover the full cost of that cat in first year, but you would put that animal or put that cat on your depreciation schedule which it does bring up a great point um, for new brand new breeders starting out is you might have to think about business startup costs and organization costs and things like that. Um, but you, you wouldn't put a kitten on depreciation schedule because he's not in service and you're not using that kitten's not breeding yet. So you would put cats on depreciation that are working um, animals. So if you bought a kitten today, and if he's working by the end of the year and placed in service by the end of the year, then you could put him or her on your depreciation schedule. Hmm. But and if you the next year when he starts working, then he goes on next year's right. depreciation list. Right. Okay. Correct. All right. Um, oh, okay. You keep mentioning sole proprietor. Mm -hmm. And you know, this is a, Another big question um, about structuring a business. 
It's another one that comes up um, in our group mm -hmm. all the time. Um, I personally have an LLC that is taxed as a sub S corp, but I have other businesses as well. I've always structured my businesses like that for tax purposes, but it definitely gets confusing. Mm -hmm. And people don't understand why, first of all, they would need to do that, not need to, but how it could benefit them, you know, in a, in for tax implication wise. And you put up, you posted, it just came up in our group the other day again, which kind of prompted me to contact you about this interview. You put up an awesome spreadsheet, like an example of the difference between being a sole proprietor and an and LLC or taxes as a sub S corp. It was great The just the savings that you get. Mm -hmm. And that's really all about structuring a business. And I know that, um, you know, we offering advice on how you should structure businesses it can, it can be sensitive. It's a sensitive area on, you know, depending on your sure. income level and, you know, what tax bracket you're in right now and how you set things up, but just kind of in a simple way, tell us the differences between being taxed as a sole proprietor and paying self-employment tax. And then an LLC, maybe a single member LLC, and mm -hmm. then being taxed as a sub S corp. Like what are the differences in those and why would someone might consider structuring their business that way? So the main difference in the tax savings you will find is in the self-employment tax. So on a schedule C or sole proprietor, if you have um, $50,000 in net income, you're going to have income tax on that 50,000, just as if you worked at a job somewhere. Mm -hmm. But in addition to that, you're, you're also going to have the self-employment tax in addition to the income tax. And the self-employment tax is roughly 15%. Mm -hmm. um, so you're going to have an extra 15% in tax on that bottom line, in addition to regular income tax. So if you're in a 22% bracket and add on 15%, you're now in a 37% tax that you're paying on your profit mm -hmm. or your net income. Whereas if you if you decide to be taxed as a sub S corp, whether you incorporate or become an LLC and um, be taxed as a sub S, then you are going to save that self-employment tax. That 15% is not taxed on a sub S. It's only on sole proprietor or partnerships, um, which is different, but um, you save that 15% in self-employment tax. So that is, is the savings on becoming an S Corp. There are some things to keep in mind because the whole benefit of an S Corp is low self-employment tax. So, but you do have to pay yourself a payroll um, as an S Corp if you're going to be taking money out of the business. And so if you do... Payroll, you do have payroll tax on that, but you can structure that payroll um, to to maximize the tax savings and you can plan that. So that is, is the main thing is the tax savings of self-employment. Income tax is the same either way. You're going to pay income tax on this the net profit the same either way. Yeah. It's the self-employment tax. Is a uh, single member LLC tax the same as a sole proprietor? If they yes. Yeah, if they, if do, they do not elect to be yeah. sub S, they will be taxed the same as a sole proprietor. Right. Okay. Thank you for that. That's um, that's a big. That's like an umbrella view, a fifty thousand foot view of structuring the business, and uh, that's a great explanation of it. So, thank you for that. Do you um, offer tax services to if they're outside of Missouri? I do. I do have clients in Florida. I have clients in Texas. Um, I have clients in Illinois and Kansas. So I do offer um, tax services to those outside of Missouri. Oh, that's exciting. <laughs> yes. So you do everything virtually and um, I do a lot virtually. I do a lot virtually. Um, and do you have like the portal? I know that's what my tax account mm -hmm. is. You got the portal yeah. where everybody uh, you upload your, um, information and then you take it from there guys yes if you do your taxes yourself stop you can, like, <laughs> you can relieve so much at least i know this is how it is where for me just like to give it to someone 
and let them use their knowledge and, and prepare your taxes for you. And, you know, take advantage of what they know about the credits and the deductions. And, you know, I really think this is what my um, my tax lady always says to me is like, it's knowing how to fill the forms out. Like if right. you how IRS, you know, the forms that are available, it's all push pushing paper to the IRS. But if you don't know what forms to fill out and how to fill this out, you might be paying more taxes than you actually need to be. So you might. There are certain elections you can make to help. And if you forget to check a box or do something like that, then you might miss yourself out on some tax benefit elections. Yes, yes. So um, how would somebody get in contact with you if they're interested in you might get like completely bombarded with new tax <laughs> clients? <laughs> Um, I do have a website, KesslerAccounting.com, okay. um, and my email is admin at KesslerAccounting.com, and my phone number is um, 417-967-1040, so you could call my office, email, or go online and fill out some contact information there. Oh my gosh, thank you. I did not know you did that. I'm so, I'm excited. Yeah. I'm excited. I didn't know you, you did that for um, outside of your state. So that's great. Um, yep. I'll make sure I put Erica's website and all of her contact information on our website, on the blog post for this, um, catbreedersensei.com. You can look for, uh, I'm not sure what we're going to call the title yet, but it will definitely be something related to IRS and, you know, taxes for cat breeders. Um, do you have anything else to add? Like any, it's, March, we're currently doing this interview on March 14th. So we're in the heat of, you know, gathering documents and everything that we need to get our taxes filed in time. Do um, you have any last minute? I, I just recommend that folks um, make sure to not kind of bury your head in the sand. And some folks are like, I just don't want to file. I just, it's going to be awful. Make sure you file something. Um, that starts the statute of limitations for one thing. And if you do find that you owe tax and you weren't prepared for that, the IRS is very um, conducive to doing payment plans if you need to. And each state might be different. I don't know about your state, individual states, but the IRS will do a payment plan and then you can kind of get yourself back on track um, for next year and get ahead if needed. If you, uh, and just make sure to keep your documentation and it's great to keep stuff throughout the year. It's easier, obviously, but we're all human and we have our cats to take care of and stuff gets away <laughs> from us. But if you need to do an extension, you can, mm -hmm. um, but the extension is the only extension to file, not to pay. So, but if you need to do an extension, please do one. So you avoid that failure to file penalty, which can be steep. Um, do you recommend people make an estimated tax payments throughout the year, like quarterly or? If, if I, it depends on each person, but yes, if there is a net income from it, I don't know what else they have on their return, but generally you can make quarterly estimated payments um, through the year. And then that makes April not quite so bad. Right. Generally. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They do. They have, um, I make mine through EFTPS. It's like you can mm -hmm. do them electronically you just yep. you know, make a payment and. It does make it easier when you file your taxes if you owe money. So right, right. Okay, well, um, I think that's all we have. So again, Erica, thank you for your time. I appreciate it very, very much. And thanks for being Me a part too. of our thanks for being a part of our group. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. All right. We'll talk to you later. All right, talk to you later. <laughs> bye bye.